The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Pause while there is strength and breath to play again with love and death. Love and death, the two supreme games of life itself. Love, which is the only meaning of life, and death, which is the end. But can there be another meaning, or perhaps another ending? Pause. Pause, as the poet says, and listen. mystery drama, Don't Die Without Me, was especially adapted from the O. Henry classic for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan, and stars Robert Dryden and Marion Seldes. Restless, shifting, as fugacious as time itself is a certain vast bulk of the population of the red brick district of the lower west side of Manhattan. Homeless, they have a hundred homes. They flit from furnished room to furnished room, transients forever, transients in abode and transients in heart and mind. They sing Home Sweet Home in ragtime. Thus begins a tale by O. Henry, the great master of irony, which illuminates two of life's greatest ironies, love and death. Ah, but the tale is begun. Let the storyteller continue. Hence, the houses of this district, having had a thousand dwellers, should have a thousand tales to tell. Yes, there must be a story behind every one of those windows. This open one on the second story from whence comes music played on Mr. Edison's latest invention... The tune is ragtime. But does the heart beat in ragtime too? Or to the lonely listener, is it a song of love, of hate, of hope, or despair? Uh, wait, wait. What's that down the street? A crowd, an ambulance. Uh, and isn't that my good friend, Sergeant O'Donoghue? All right, all right. Now, move on. Don't you have nothing better to do? Uh, Sergeant O'Donoghue. Oh, it's you, is it? Well, what happened here this evening? You spelled my name wrong. Uh, it was printed incorrectly in your newspaper last Friday. The linotype setter is an Englishman. Uh, well, that explains it. Well, what explains this? What's taking place here tonight? Well, now, sir, how would I know that? Just being a police officer. Oh, come <laughs> on, Sergeant. Pub police officer. Officers know everything, especially if they're named O'Donoghue. O'Donoghue with a G. I remember. Now, sir, tell me something. Why do they come to New York Town? Why does who come to New York? All the sweet and pretty young things. It's the bright lights of Broadway, Sergeant. Even a police officer knows that. Yes. Like moths to the flame. I see where this is leading. And here this evening we had a little moth. Perhaps she believed she was a butterfly, but what does it matter? The flame consumes them all in the end. Well, I'm certainly a man who can follow a figure of speech, but what, what is this flame to which you refer, Sergeant? The flame of despair and the flame of loneliness. They sit alone in a furnished room, a stranger among strangers, and they look at the flames. The leaping yellow flames... The leaping yellow flame? But now it has become the flicker and blue light of the gas range. They look at the light, and it's so cold and distant. A chill flame without light and warmth, like... Like life itself, cold and dark. So they lean forward, and almost without thinking, they blow out the flame. Now, they're alone in the blackness of the night... And all is silent except for the gas. The low, soft hiss of the gas. What you're saying is that a girl in this building 
turned on the, the low, soft hiss, like the hiss of a snake. But a kindly snake. She's dead then, Sergeant? Yes, sir. May the good Lord rest her gentle. Are they sure? Oh, yes, the doctor was there. He passed down the word. Uh, you'll, you'll have to step out of the way, sir. They're, they're taking her down now. A very young doctor who rode the ambulance for the city hospital and who was still very new on the job tried to hide the horror in his heart with a look of cynical boredom on his face. But wasn't quite experienced enough to carry it off yet. He was followed by two orderlies who carried a stretcher. The face of the poor unfortunate was supposed to be covered, but the blanket had slipped. For a moment, I caught a glimpse of a fair young face with reddish gold hair. A beauty mark on the chin. Just for a moment, and she was gone. Into the ambulance and away, to be lost and gone forever. Yes? I've come in to take away the breakfast dishes, sir. Well, I see I can't do that, since you've had neither a sip nor a bite. Mrs. Paulidge, you have excellent powers of observation. And you seem to be a bit snippy this morning, Mr. Porter. Oh, that's true. You can't expect a man to be in a good temper all the time, especially when he's having trouble writing a story. <laughs> You're having trouble writing a story. Oh, yes. How is that possible? Why would a beautiful young lady want to end her life? There's a man in it somewhere. Uh, could there be another reason? Nah, not for a woman. Now, this young lady ended her life in a... Well, uh, it could be considered a theatrical rooming house. Perhaps she was despondent because her career had failed. Now, I wouldn't believe it. You said she was young and beautiful? Well... The world doesn't have to come to an end for that kind. No, no, no. I could only believe she'd end it all for love. That's the only way you'd have it? Afraid so. And you'd better stop fighting it. The reddish gold hair. For a moment, it seemed like a halo around that angelic young face. A face I knew I would never forget. Why? Why did she do it? Who was she? I looked through the papers, nothing, not a word. Uh, so much happens in the city, there isn't room for everything. Especially the passing of an unknown, obscure young girl, even if she is beautiful. So many of them are beautiful. So beautiful it breaks your heart. Well, I would have to ask questions. Yes? Are you the landlady? Yes, I am. Your name's Mrs. Purdy. You want to rent a room? About the young lady who died here last night. What young lady? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. Are you a cop? No. Then what are you snooping around for, asking questions? I'd, I'd like to know why you she... You got the wrong address, sir. Now, wait. Before you slam the door in my face, I, I'm a newspaper man. Well, what do you want? She was nothing. She was nobody. Who's going to be interested in reading about her? I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, come on. Give me a break, sir. If it gets known somebody done the Dutch act in that room, nobody's going to want to rent it. Well, what would you? It doesn't have to get into the newspaper. Oh. Well, now, you're a gentleman. Are you sure you're a reporter? Can we talk inside? <laughs> This is the room. This is the room. I see. Well, what's the matter? It ain't nice. Well, I mean, what do you want for four dollars a week, the Ritz? What was her name? I don't know her name. Well, how can that be possible? Well, the name she gave me was Helen Smith. Do I know if that was her real name? What did she do? Well, I don't know. Where did she work? I don't know. Didn't you ask? So why should I ask? If they want to tell me, they tell me. Otherwise, all they got to do is behave themselves and pay the rent. Where did she come from? I don't know. How long had she been here? How long? Well, 
three weeks. Yes, I remember I was supposed to collect the fourth week's rent from her this morning. So, you don't know who she was, where she came from, what she did, or why she killed herself? Who knows? What happened to her belongings? Belongings? Oh, oh she... She didn't have none. Well, what I mean, she she had the dress she was wearing and, and another one. A skirt, two blouses, some under things, and the shoes she was wearing. Oh, just a few stitches of clothing was all she had to show for the world. Poor child. And among the things she owned, there was nothing to identify her? No, sir. No jewelry? Jewelry? Oh, oh, oh bless us. No. Uh, a watch, a ring, a bracelet? Nothing. Who discovered her? Oh, oh, that was my misfortune. I was sitting in the kitchen drinking beer with Mrs. McCool, my next-door neighbor. And I said, is there a smell, Mrs. McCool? And she answers, there's a smell, Mrs. Purdy. And with that, we put down our glasses and come rushing up here to the third floor back. We open the door. And there she is, poor child, laying on the bed. And... Yes? Well, we, we open the window. But it's too late. So we both ran screaming downstairs into the street. Well, what else can you tell me? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, sir. We saw the policeman on the beat, and he sent for the ambulance. Oh, not that it had done her any good at all. A and there's nothing you can tell me about the girl? Well, I've already told you everything I know. No. lunchtime. I don't want any lunch. You won't write any better if you're hungry. Confound it, Mrs. Pollage. I want to be let alone. I made you Manhattan clam chowder. All right, set it down. Ah, Mrs. Pollage, I'm licked. The story won't come out. Enjoy the chowder. Why does this story defeat me? It has everything. It has youth, beauty, tragedy, death, and yet I can't... I can't put anything together. The room, seedy and sinister. Yes, sinister. I don't know why. A dungeon, a cell of despair. She came there. She chose the place. Why? <laughs> why is the story? Have I lost it? Lost what? It, it, the divine, it, the gift, the God-given gift to write. I don't think so. Who is this girl? Why did she kill herself? You should be giving answers instead of asking questions. I'm even asking the wrong questions. Does it matter what her real name was or where she comes from? Isn't it up to me to create all that? I've always been able to do it before. Come in. Good morning, sir. Oh. Why, Sergeant O'Donoghue. Uh, with a G. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I come down here because I thought I could bring you something that might be of interest uh, from a literary point of view. Yes? You remember, sir, it, it was just a week ago, this poor girl that done herself in. I wish I could forget. Well, it's happened again. What's happened again, Sergeant? Another one. Another one of those unfortunate situations in the same house, in the same room. What are you telling me, Sergeant? I suppose what I'm saying is that the room stayed vacant six days. Then, last night, the landlady rents it out to a young gentleman. And early this morning, he took the same way out. What are the odds? We're discussing the final desperate actions of two defeated young people. What are the odds that they could have chosen the same room out of so many thousands in the city? Consider the room. Is there something in the room or about the room? We try to answer questions like these in Act Two, which I shall bring you shortly. million. The four million human souls who filled the New York of O. Henry's day. With four million triumphs, four million defeats, four million comedies, 
four million tragedies. The shifting, seething mass of four million lives. Loving, hating, living, dying. And we're concerned with two of them. A golden-haired girl and... He was a dark-haired young man. What else can you tell me about him? Well, he was... He was maybe 27, 28. Uh, tell me everything. Oh, please, sir. If this ever gets out, I'll never be able to rent that room. Never. I want to know everything. Well, last night, there was a ringing of my doorbell. And... Oh, please, sir. Go on. Last night, what time? It was nine o'clock, I believe. Nine o'clock. Go ahead. I don't like to think about it. Your doorbell rang. Well, yes. Yes, and, and, and he asked if... Do you have a room to let? Well, I, I have the third floor back. May I see it? It's five dollars a week. Oh, that's all right. In advance. I, I don't object. All right, well, come along. Now, I, I, I keep a very nice, clean house. What business are you in? How long do you plan to stay there? But I must say, you ain't very talkative. Would she... Oh, Lord, would she have come to this? Fallen to this? No, oh, no, please. What's that you're saying? Yeah, well, just down the hallway. Well, and this is the room. Oh, I see. It's a nice room. It ain't often vacant. I get the most elegant people here. There's lots of closet room. Oh, it's a place everybody likes. It never stays idle long. Do you have many uh, theatrical people rooming here? Oh, they come and they go. There's a good proportion of the lodgers are connected with the theater. Actor folk never stay long anywheres. I get my share. Do you want the room? Uh, I, um, I suppose so. Like I said, it's five a week in advance. All right. The room's been made nice and fresh. Your towels and the water pitcher's full. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Birdie. Uh, oh, I didn't get your name. Uh, uh, Jones. Jones. All right, we'll leave it be Jones. Uh, Mrs. Purdy, a, a young girl, about uh, 22. Would she have been one of your lodgers? Her name, uh, her name was Miss Fashioner, Eloise Fashioner. No, no, I can't say I remember that name. A fair complexion girl, medium height, slender with golden hair, and and a beauty mark on her chin. Have you seen her? No, I ain't seen her. Uh, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, are you all right? Huh? Uh, oh, yes, yes, uh, good night, Mrs. Purdy. But you had seen her. You had seen her. She was the girl who... That girl's name was Helen Smith. The description, the golden hair, the fair complexion, the beauty mark on the chin. Oh, there could be a thousand girls it like that. It was the same girl, and you know it. Oh, please, sir. Don't say that. It was the same girl. All right. And what if it was? Was it my place to tell him? What would you have me say? Oh, yes, sir. A young lady answering that very description turned the gas on in this room six nights ago. Is that what I should have said, is it? He, he was looking for her. Please, sir, don't say any more. I'm scared out of me wits as it is. There are thousands of rooming houses throughout the city. There are tens of thousands of furnished rooms. What made him pick your place? Why did he choose your house? Why did he come to your house? That's what he asked me. That's what he asked. What are you saying? Sir, I... well, he hadn't been in the room an hour when he came downstairs and knocked on me door. Who is it? Open the door. What is it? What's wrong? Mrs. Purdy. Yes? Miss Bashner. Miss Bashner? The young lady I asked you about. Oh, she, yes. She has been in the room. She, she was? She has been in that room. Oh, well, now, how could she do to whoever she is? I knew it. I knew it. Something drew me to this house. I spent days walking the streets of Broadway. I spoke to, to the managers, theatrical agents, everyone, anyone from the highest to the lowest. Mr. Jones, it's, it's, it's late. Have you seen her? Have you seen her? And everywhere from everyone, the answer was no. Something said to me to walk westward toward the river. And I did. And then the same voice said, here. Turn in here. Stop here. Rest here. Stay here. Here is where you will find her. Now 
tell me, Mrs. Purdy. I've already told you, Mr. Jones. I ain't seen her. No. No, I can't accept that. The voice was too strong, too, too clear. It guided me here, to this house. I wouldn't know about that. And to that room. She was in that room. No. Who was in that room? Who? Who was the last one to occupy it? Uh, a gentleman. No. It was a woman, a young woman, a pale, slender woman with golden hair and blue eyes and a beauty mark on her chin. Eloise Bashner. My Eloise. It had to be. Because I had to keep my promise. What promise? Tell me she was here. And tell me where she went. Well, she... Well, the one you're thinking of, she was never here. But... You just have a very... Great imagination. You insist that Eloise has never occupied that room. I don't know your young lady. All right. All right. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter now. And then he went up to the room, turned out the gas light. Then he turned the handle of the jet again without striking a flame. And he lay down on the bed and... and... You didn't tell him about... Miss Vashner? How could I know her name was Vashner? Where did he say he was from? He didn't. And you didn't ask? I never ask. But did he have any papers, any identification? No, none at all. How do you know, Mrs. Purdy? How do I know? Well, I looked. There was nothing. Just as we know nothing about the girl, we also know nothing about the man. Most important, we know nothing at all of how he happened to come to this very place. Oh, I, I feel sorry for them two young folk. But, but I don't know what can be done about it. And life goes on, sir. And I've got to get the room cleaned up and hope I can rent it out again. You've just rented it. I have. To who? To me. You... Well, now, why would you want to live in a dump like this? I want to spend the night in the third floor back. Two people had died in that room. Were they connected to each other? My romantic writer's instinct said yes. I wanted them to know each other, to be in love with each other, and to have died because of a misunderstanding. That was the story I wanted to write. A story of star-crossed lovers in the shadow of the Ninth Avenue elevated. Then, yet, there could have been another interpretation. The room itself. There may have been something in the room itself. Something strange and terrifying and deadly. In the room itself. The only way to find out was to sleep in the room. Spend the night there. And if necessary, fight against the room itself. Yes? Uh, sir, I, I wanted to know, is there... Is there anything you need? Oh, no, no, no. I'll be quite comfortable, thank you. Why? Uh, n n nothing. Well, I'm not sure it's nothing. Mrs. Purdy? It is. It is. It, it's nothing at all. Well, then why did you hesitate before you said nothing? Because, well... Yes, Mrs. Purdy. Because? Because whatever else was true about them, the fact is the last two people who slept in this room were troubled people. Troubled? You know what I mean. Troubled it's something that shows in their eyes. Oh, you can hear it in their voice. And, sir, you look like a troubled person to me. I? I do? Yes, sir, you do. And, well, maybe the room gets to be, well, too much. Do you know what you're talking about, Mrs. Purdy? Yes, sir. And so do you. So I'm asking you if you're really and truly troubled... Don't spend the night here. Thank you for your concern, Mrs. Purdy. Well, I just couldn't afford to have a, a third one. I mean three. And in just about the space of a week, oh, I'd be ruined forever. Oh, I, 
hadn't thought of that. Well, it might be best if I was never to rent it out again. I could use it for storage. Yes. That's exactly what I'll do. I've just decided, starting tonight. Is starting tomorrow, Mrs. Birdie. But I won't let you stay here. I'm afraid you have no choice. I've paid my rent in advance. All right, sir. But after it's too late, don't say I didn't warn you. Do these things travel in threes? Hopefully not. Will the third be our storyteller? All we know for certain is that we have a room. And the room seems to have a secret. A deadly secret. Certain also is the fact that we're on the threshold of Act Three, where all secrets must come out into the open. First, we had a golden-haired girl, Miss Helen Smith, or Miss Eloise Vashner. Then there was a gentleman whose name may or not have been Mr. Jones. Both seem to have succumbed to a fateful, uh, a fateful what? We don't know. But neither could survive the third floor back. A seedy little furnished room in a tawdry little rooming house on the west side of Manhattan. O. Henry's Manhattan. And now the master storyteller is determined to discover if he can survive it himself. The first thing is to turn the gas up high. High, bright, light. Nothing like bright light to dispel dark secrets. So, what have we here? Dingy, grimy, little cell. But what's the story? Could it have been... Murder? Murder. No, rule nothing out. Suppose I were to talk with my friend Sergeant Seamus O'Donoghue, uh, with a G. Supposing I were to say, you're satisfied with suicide? Satisfied? Oh, bless your soul, sir. Who could be satisfied? All right, I can understand that, but there are other possibilities. Such as? Murder. Murder? By who? Oh, we're in the realm of supposition. But I appreciate that. Mrs. Purdy, speculate with me. Suppose Miss Smith or Miss Vashner had something of value. Such as? Oh, a ring, a jewel of some sort. A gift from a loved one. And Mrs. Purdy saw it. And Mrs. Purdy was tempted and Mrs. Purdy stole into the room. She had a key. And she turned up the gas. And your evidence? <laughs> I have none. Well, then of what value is this theory to the police? It's of no value at all to the police. But then why do you present it to me? Because I'm a writer and everything goes through my mind. Well, sir... Uh... Going along with that theory, for the sake of argument, as it were. See, she killed the poor, unfortunate young lady. How do you account for the death of the young man? The young man knew. What did he know? He knew the young girl had been in that room. How? Mm, I don't know. Yes. But he knew that Mrs. Purdy had killed the young lady. Well, but, but how did he know that? I don't know that either, yet. But he insisted to Mrs. Purdy that the young lady had been in that room. Mrs. Purdy was afraid of him. So, later that night, when he was asleep... You're saying he... and she did the same thing to him. Uh, yes, I believe that's what I'm saying. Well, no, I must go back to the original question. Where is your evidence? Unfortunately, it doesn't exist. <laughs> well, then, sir, where are we? We're still at the beginning of my story. What did happen to these unfortunate people? And what is there about that room? And so, 
I sit here and wonder. Let me examine the room again. The room. The threadbare rug. Smudged finger marks on the faded wallpaper. The bed, distorted by bursting springs. And the room itself has been carelessly set in order. And on the dresser, a half dozen hairpins. Discreet, anonymous. In the drawers, a fragment of a handkerchief. A broken bone button, a pawnbroker's card. Two forgotten marshmallows. A book on the divination of dreams. And deep dust on the windowsills. An old dried out half-smoked cigar in the corner. An old cork. Broken pencil. All the debris of those who are homeless in this, their temporary home. And then, then, I could smell something sweet and delightful. It was the smell of mignonette. It came as a single buffet of wind with such sureness and fragrance and emphasis that it almost seemed a, a living visitant. And then the room grew dark. I heard voices, voices clear, and here, in the room, I love you, I love you, Eloise. And I love you, George. I don't want to live without you. Oh, George, I'm supposed to be the romantic one. I, I can't conceive of life without you. Well, you'll have to live without me for a little while, George. Darling, I... I don't want you to break your heart. Nothing. No one can ever break my heart. Except you. And you'd never do it. The world can break your heart. Especially the world of the stage. Oh, George, I must have my chance. I'll go to New York with you. No. No, you can't give up your job at the bank. I can get a job at a bank in New York. No, George, this is your bank. Here they know you and appreciate you. In ten years, you'll be the president. I'm in a terrible position because... Well, you'll think I'm only saying this to keep you here. Oh, no. I believe you're saying what you feel is the truth. Don't go because... Because you're not good enough. Oh. You're angry. No, I'm not. I... Darling, you're so good at our little community drama group, but I've been to New York... I've seen great actresses, Ada Rhee and Bernhardt and, and, and Miss Barrow. I know I'm not as good as they are yet. But there are thousands but... and thousands of hopeful girls like you. Oh, George, dear, we've talked about all this before. <sighs> yes, I suppose we have. And we agreed that I am to have my chance. And at the end of a year, if... Darling, I want you to take this ring. Oh, George... It must have been so expensive. Would you, um, read what's inscribed inside? Yes. Don't die without me. Why, <laughs> George. Remember it. What a thing to say. I know how much you want to succeed as an actress. But do you, George, really? Yes. And, well, that's why I'm afraid for you. George. Don't be. If New York says no, I don't want you to feel it's the end of the world. You must never... Never what, George? Die. Oh, George. No, I mean, let your hopes die, your, your spirit die. Let the brightness inside you die. Do you understand? Yes, George. And if you ever feel that things are too much, you must send for me. That's what it means. Yes, George. Yes, my darling. I know. I opened my eyes. I saw nothing. But the room was no longer dark. It was bright. The gaslight was burning cheerily. Where were they, those two people? Who were they? I heard them so clearly. 
They could have been in the room with me. George, he must have been Mr. Jones. And Eloise, of course, she had been Eloise Vashner. And this had been their parting scene. Then, once again, the stale, dank odor of the room had disappeared. Only to be replaced by the sweet aroma of the mignonette. And once again, voices. It's a beautiful ring. I didn't say it wasn't. But it's small. Yes, but it, it should be worth... Worth what? It has an inscription which lowers the value of the ring. Oh, please. How much for the ring? Huh? Uh, where do you live? Does it matter? On the west side? No, no, no. Where is your home? My home? Well? I... I don't have a home anymore. Oh, yes, you do. I can't go back. You can. Now, tell me. Where is your home? Why? Because, whatever it is, I will give you the price of a railroad ticket home. Why don't you go back to him? Who? Him, whoever he is. Do you mean to stand there and tell me there isn't a boy back home? He wouldn't want me now. Well, the ring. Do you see what it says on the ring? Do you mean a boy who would have that engraved on a ring wouldn't want you? Please, give me anything you want for the ring. Anything you think it's worth. Call him. Send him a, a telegram. I can't. Don't you understand? I can't. And once again, the voices were gone. The room was still dark, and the sweet smell of mignonette persisted. I heard a whisper at first. Then it grew louder. It was her voice. The voice of the girl called Eloise. George. George. Are you there? Oh, George. How did you find me? Where are you? Eloise. Where are you? Oh, George. How did you find me? I hear you, Eloise, but I can't see you. How I wanted you to come to me. How I longed for you. How I needed you. Eloise. It's you, Eloise. But I, I, I couldn't, not after what I, what I did. Eloise. You were right, George. It was the end of the world. My hopes died and my spirit. Eloise, where are you? And I died. <laughs> Eloise. Oh, Eloise, you you forgot what I said. No. George, I I never forgot. Why did you do it, Eloise? Why did you die without me? You have to forget me. You're still young and strong and filled with hope and spirit and brightness. Why did you die without me, Eloise? Please, George. No. You can't die without me. You can. No. George. Don't. It won't take long, darling. I'll be with you in just a few minutes. Suddenly, the aroma of mignonette was gone. In its place was another smell. A sickly, Swedish smell. And I heard it in the dark. I heard it. Sergeant Seamus O'Donohue's deadly snake. The gentle snake that neither bites nor crushes, but who breathes the sweet and pungent air of death. Yes. The jet was turned on. But the flame was out. Quickly, because by now I was starting to cough and gasp, I turned off the jet, 
threw open the window and breathed, breathed the open, life-giving air. I must say it's a beautiful story. You like it, then? They both die. But since they die for love, it's all right. Thank you. Is it true? True? A writer finds his own truth. But in this case, you could find the actual truth, should you care to. Is that a fact, Mrs. Pollard? How? Well, we don't know if these two people actually knew each other or anything about the ring other than your own fancy. I did hear the voices. <laughs> but a writer always hears voices. You could ask the pawnbroker. The pawnbroker? Yes, you said when you were looking around the room, you found a pawnbroker's card. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I did. So wouldn't it just stand to reason? Yes. All you yes, have to do yes, is go down and see the pawnbroker. Ask if there was actually such a girl and such a ring. I could have done that. But I didn't. You didn't? Why not? Because, Miss Pollage, that would have been cheating. Which is something O. Henry would never do to a reader. And so, the master of irony and suspense was so good at it. Because in suspense is how he loved to live himself. He must have been his own best reader just as surprised by his surprise endings as you and I are. I'll be back shortly. Yes, he loved to write, O. Henry did. And his favorite theme was the one of two lovers kept apart in the maze of the great unfeeling city. Sometimes they were united in this world, and sometimes they had to wait for the next. But he always joined them together at the end. For to O. Henry, the end was eternity. For you, our listener, however, there is no end. We go on here seven times each week. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Marion Seldes, Joan Shea, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. News follows on WBBM Chicago. CBS News. The State Department has no comment to a newspaper report about an assassination plot against Henry Kissinger. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting on the CBS radio network. The New York Daily News says it has learned that a group of extreme right-wing Israelis paid $150,000 to one or more foreign hitmen to kill the Secretary of State, apparently to revenge what they consider Kissinger's sellout of Israel during his numerous shuttle diplomacy efforts. At the State Department, spokesman Robert Funseth was asked about a reported White House request for an assessment of threats against Kissinger's life. We have said that we are unable to provide any details about the assessment uh, or, or to comment about any, any specific threats. And this is consistent uh, both with the Secret Service and State Department policy not to uh, comment in any way about any, uh, about any threats. Kissinger was honored by the Washington Diplomatic Corps Thursday evening at a farewell reception and by President Ford, who showed up to bestow upon the Secretary the nation's highest civilian decoration, the Medal of Freedom. Mr. Ford called Kissinger the greatest Secretary of State in the history of our republic, and Kissinger in turn praised Mr. Ford's leadership in assessing his years at the head of the State Department. In every trouble spot, we cannot say that we have solved 
the problems. But I think we can say that under your leadership, we have taken the first steps and in many areas, major steps towards a solution. Earlier in the day, Mr. Ford joined a presidential tradition, the ceremonial planting of a tree on the White House grounds. Mr. Ford's contribution to the Executive Arboretum and Eastern White Pine will grow between John Kennedy's Pacific Pride Apple Tree and Dwight Eisenhower's Northern Red Oak. President-elect Carter has returned to Plains, concluding his last pre-inaugural visit to the nation's capital. He spent the day Thursday in consultation with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying afterward he had learned a lot from the ten hours of briefings. Mr. Carter interrupted the military conversation several times to place overseas telephone calls to President G-Star Destang of France and Prime Ministers Callahan of Great Britain and Schmidt of West Germany, suggesting an economic summit conference in a few months. The American Humane Association is urging the governor of Illinois and the American Legion to prohibit a fox hunt scheduled for Saturday near the town of Royal, Illinois. The local Legion Post is sponsoring the event. The foxes are blamed for recent livestock losses. Participants are required to have a hunting license and a club-type weapon apparently to be used to beat the captured foxes to death. In New York City, the ASPCA and the police put a stop to the rather droll effort to promote a so-called sporting event. Steve Reed of station WCBS reports. There on fashionable Fifth Avenue, perched on a horse, was a man dressed as a matador, signs promoting a bullfight draped on either side of the horse. Not far away, another man tried to interest passers-by in $25 tickets. Some people chuckled, but the ASPCA was not amused. Executive Director Duncan Wright said he had been gathering evidence for two months. So this is probably the ultimate and deliberate cruelty to an animal. It's planned, uh, and uh, it's just uh, something we're not going to have here. The law says it's not supposed to be, and we're not going to permit it. The plan was to ferry spectators to a makeshift arena, several barges anchored four miles off the coast of New York beyond state or federal jurisdiction. Authorities said that some time ago the would-be promoter had another idea that didn't quite get off the ground. Gambling aboard an airborne plane. This is Steve Reed for CBS News New York. And I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News. <laughs> 